I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Well, coming up, Waymo gets the green light. The U.S. Appeals Court clears the way for Alphabet's Waymo to proceed to trial over claims that Uber stole its trade secrets. Waymo's CEO breaks the case in a Bloomberg exclusive. Plus, special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian collusion has social media firmly under the microscope. Why prosecutors are zeroing in on hackers. And another Bloomberg exclusive, the Blue Apron CEO talks about the transition from unicorn to publicly traded company to stock market dog and the meal company's strategy for fending off growing competition. But first, to our lead, a U.S. appeals court has cleared the way for Waymo's lawsuit against Uber to proceed to trial in October. The autonomous car developer claims that Uber stole trade secrets for its self-driving cars, and the judge declines Uber's request to send the suit to arbitration. The case center around Waymo's allegation that an engineer, uh, Anthony Lewandowski, a former employee of both companies, took thousands of proprietary files from Waymo to Uber. The judge also ruled that Waymo uh, will, will get a, a, a access to a key piece of evidence, a report that aimed to scrub Lewandowski of, from any of Google's proprietary information and examining Uber's acquisition of the company, Otto, for $680 million in stock. Joining me right now is uh, Eric Newcomer. Cover all things Uber for us. Um, so first, I just want to backtrack just a little bit. People yeah. don't know the story, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. But just really basically, this guy worked. Uh, it was was highly sought after engineer right. uh, working with Waymo, which was which which right. was a Google thing. Right? Anthony Lewandowski, super right. influential uh, engineer at Google's self-driving car company, Waymo, leaves, starts this self-driving trucking company called and you're like, Auto, and all of us are like. Self-driving trucks? All right, what? What's that all about? Yeah, there's a whole message around like, you know, it's monetizable sooner or whatever. But but yeah, then Uber sort of buys them pretty soon, I think less than a year after he left Google to become sort of the central. So they buy the, the auto trucking company. A very small team. But they're not actually pursuing auto trucking at all. They just want to go back to automated Certainly, cars. Certainly Uber's focus is, you know, self-driving cars. Right. And they put him in charge of their self-driving car effort. And then, you know, Waymo uh, digs around to see if they've, you know, any of their trade secrets have gone with him, and that that's basically the basis of this. And so, uh, Uber wants arbitration because why? Well, because they don't want it in public. There are lots of embarrassing details that could come out. I mean, their arbitration claim—it's easy to say this now—looks like looked like sort of a stretch, and they lost. I mean, they were basically saying that, you know, Waymo should be bound by its agreement to arbitrate things with Anthony Lewandowski. Uh, even though they're only suing Uber and not Lewandowski in this case, they have a separate so private they tried, arbitration. They tried to take with. their arbitration clause, the arbitration clause that, that uh, Alphabet had with Lewandowski, right. and say, oh no, that applies to us. <laughs> exactly, too, right. Lewandowski yeah. happens to be our nickname. Yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. sort of laughed <laughs> off. So, that, so now the trial happens. Right. And we're going to get some discovery, of course, it's surely been going on already. But uh, trial in October seems real soon. Right. And there's a, there's a key other ruling here, which was that. You know, bef Uber sort of suspected that maybe there would be issues, so they did all this diligence and had a cyber forensic firm like look into everything that Lewandowski had, and that report has sort of been tightly kept. Uber has refused to give it up, sort of didn't even mention it in the beginning, and finally a judge has said, "Okay, you need to hand that over to Waymo." So it'll be very interesting to see what that cyber forensic firm said because. We really haven't been able to turn up these 14,000 files. Like that was the explosive claim at the beginning of this suit that right. there were all these files that Uber had, and so far Waymo hasn't been able to say there they are on Uber's computer. Right. So maybe they were only on Landowski's computer if they were even there. But did they actually make it from right. Google Waymo to the to the exactly. CEO right. to his next employer, right. which is the ultimate claim? Right. Um, right. and, and, and Uber must know this now, after, right. or may, they, may, they might know it and, now. And Uber's argument seems to be, we, try, we did our best to wall it off. That's why we did all this investigation in the beginning. And even if this firm has it, which we don't know yet, you know, that was part of our effort to keep it out of Uber's now, hands. Now, what does this mean? We've only got a, uh, 30 seconds here. But what does it mean for the struggles within uh, Uber's board right now? Are they going to say, hey, this is the former CEO. Let's stick that problem on him. Or are they going to have to own this? I mean, self-driving is important to Uber. They're spending a lot of time on this issue right now. I mean, I think it's a key case. And I, I don't know. I think it's hard to imagine that anything's possible. Honestly, like, it's, and, it's and a, I don't think it's clear right it's now. It's a longer discussion, an but it's a peculiar business model right. for an asset light company yeah. to pursue an asset heavy strategy. Right. So.
uh, Grace, Eric, great stuff as always. Uh, Eric Newcomer covers Thanks. Uber and all things for us uh, related right here at uh, Bloomberg News. All right, sticking with Waymo, the CEO, uh, John Craffick uh, is on stage at Bloomberg's Sooner Than You Think conference at Cornell's new campus on New York's Roosevelt Island. Here he is speaking with Bloomberg's Brad Stone about uh, when we will all get our own self-driving cars. I think the answer literally is the name of this um, conference. Um, it's sooner than you think. Um, we've been working on this um, at Google and now at Waymo for over eight years. Um, we've driven well over three million miles. Um, we've started to talk a little bit more about some of the simulation miles that we're driving right now, which are even more important. Um, and last year alone, 2.5 billion miles in simulation. Um, we're the, to the point now where the technology is feeling mature and ready. Um, which is why we're spending a lot of time, in particular in Phoenix, but also in Mountain View, um, in something in Phoenix called the Early Rider Program, where we have actual families driving around in our cars and we're getting to understand how real people and real families would like to use this technology. I think that's the last part for us, understanding that as we continue to refine the technology before we're ready to deploy. Well, yesterday was an interesting day in terms of another piece, which is the regulatory framework. Right. Uh, Transportation Secretary Elaine Cho uh, put out a sort of vision strategy statement, uh, call, calling it Vision Strategy 2.0, which you know some consumer groups criticized for taking a little bit of a hands-off approach, allowing manufacturers to test their driverless cars on highways. And then on the same day, the NTSB came out and said highway regulators need to be more active, pointing to the, cra the unfortunate tragic crash of a man uh, last year in a Tesla. Um, you know, wh where do you see the regulatory environment right now? What are your concerns about taking this tech forward safely? It's mm, a great, great question, Brad. So um, if you look at what the administration has done and what we've seen in DC out of the last couple of weeks, really, it's, it's very encouraging for this technology because we are in the early stages, right? We really haven't served our first users yet. So it makes sense that we're careful and flexible so that we don't unnecessarily or inadvertently squelch innovation. So I think um, you know what, what we've seen in the House, um, which is something pretty special when you think about it, how many things have the House of Representatives united behind recently? I can think of none other than self-driving cars, right? which passed uh, a bill recently that's, um, I think, very supportive and in line with what we saw from Secretary Chow. Um, so I think that's great. And you know, I do think it, it, it bears reminding everyone that there's a difference between the problem we're trying to solve, which is fully self-driving, and removing the human from the car and letting our sensing and our technology and our compute do the whole driving task. Um, and the, the different problem that's trying to be solved today with driver assist technologies. And so there's a difference between those things. Right, and that's what the NTSB was ruling on, Correct. right? And, and I mean, are, are, are drivers getting a little too comfortable with some of these technologies, oh, taking their eyes off the road? Like, is, what do you see as the dangers? So it's the fundamental conundrum that, that we face in this space. And we learned it at Google um, prior to becoming Waymo back in 2012. We had um, a pilot experiment where we put some of our employees in some of our self-driving cars for highway use. And we told these very smart Googlers that they had to be very attentive, that we were going to be watching them with cameras in the car, and if they didn't behave and keep their eyes on the road, we were gonna take this free car away from them. Um, we ended up having to stop that pilot experiment after just a couple of months because those Google employees couldn't stop taking their eyes off the road. They very quickly came to trust the technology too much. And that's really the fundamental conundrum of the driver assist technologies. If at some point the car needs to ask the human to pay attention, you need to take over, and the human has fallen asleep, gotten distracted, is in a very deep conversation with someone, that could be a big problem. It's one of the reasons why we pivoted at Waymo to a full self-driving solution where we never call on the human to take over. We're gonna do the driving for you. That was Waymo CEO John Krafchick on stage at Bloomberg's Sooner Than You Think conference with Brad Stone. And when asked about the Uber lawsuit, by the way, he said that Uber's behavior was something Waymo couldn't afford to ignore. All right, I have some breaking news headlines right here. The Saudis, uh, their giant uh, IPO, the Aramco deal, uh, they were looking at an IPO, what's possibly gonna be the biggest IPO in the history of world markets. Well, looks like they might wait, not only through to next year, maybe even into 2019. That breaking story on Bloomberg News, you can see more at Bloomberg.com, and we're gonna keep an eye on that story uh, as it crosses. But uh, again, uh, Saudi Aramco IPO, maybe not coming to a market near you. All right, well, coming up, the world's had a day to digest the big news out of Apple and the product releases that came yesterday. So how does the deal look in retrospect? We're going to talk in great detail next.
Well, Wall Street shouldn't be worried about technology taking their jobs, or maybe they should. That's according to Vikram Pandit, who ran a Citigroup for years. Uh, he told Bloomberg that developments in technology could see some 30% of banking jobs disappear in the next five years. Pandit pointed to artificial intelligence, robotics, and other technologies reducing the need for staff in roles like back office functions. All right, well, Apple ushered in a new era with the iPhone Tuesday at the Steve Jobs Theater in Cupertino. Uh, CEO Tim Cook unveiled a suite of new products. You probably knew that because you're watching a technology show. Everyone's been talking about it. iPhone 10 and so much more. Muted stock reaction, maybe because some of the news is out. But what does it all mean with a little data reflect by both journalists and Wall Street and the like? Stock down about 1%. Alex Webb joined us right now from Bloomberg News. Uh, you were uh, covering this thing in great detail. You cover Apple in great detail. Um, what's the reaction uh, a day afterwards? It's sort of business as usual, really. Is, 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 is the breathless hyping of Apple products that uh, we all get forced into? Is that over now? I mean, when yes. you say we all, I'd hope I'm not part of the breathlessness, although the, the bags under my eyes tell a story of, in terms of the fatigue from yesterday. The, uh, We'd reported a lot going into the event about what was to be expected. There are a few things we didn't. A lot seemed to leak out, actually. Yes, and just, some leaks in the previous job. weekend, but also a lot of it is hard work, not least from our colleague Mark Gurman, who's right. really good at this stuff. Um, Analysts were basically relieved to see what they expected. There were no great disappointment. There were also no big surprises. Some had thought there might perhaps be a rear-facing 3D scanner. So on the phone, you point towards people when you've got the screen on this side. That wasn't the case. Perhaps it leaves them a bit, little bit of space for upgrades in the years to come. You don't want to do too much too soon, then people won't buy the phone next year. So the self-driving car telephone phone. Which makes a cup of coffee, right. you know, it's not quite yeah, there no, yet. No, gerbil no. trimmer, none of that. Um, but uh, the, the, as Wall Street started to look at this, you know, some of the financial news, right, what seemed a pretty good guide for the, the current quarter, uh, but uh, maybe a disappointing release date, didn't seem to hurt the stock too much. No, uh, the expect we'd reported going back almost a year there would like to be delays because of the lack of OLED there are only a handful of factories in the world which make organic light emitting diode displays Look at you that's what you, you use the acronym and you actually know what it there means. we go yes and um, it's uh, this had created some delays and that was expected going into the quarter the forecast for this course the one we're currently in um, that uh, ends at the end of uh, September was uh, that there the forecast that Apple gave right. did not necessarily include the sales which will come from the top-line iPhone. Analysts and investors were relieved that other parts of the business, the iPhone 8, which has been released right. and will be coming this quarter, and then things like services were able to prop up or likely right. to prop up earnings in place of the, the lacking iPhone 10. Uh, a little technology trivia from an old man here is that uh, OLED was invented by Kodak. And they completely ma failed to, to benefit from this fantastic invention that their great scientists created, but managed to have to license it out and eventually sold a lot of those patents. Well, but I think that, but I think what's interesting here, and, and the question remains, you know, Kodak once a great innovator lost its way. Has Apple regained some of the notion of it, uh, Apple as an innovator, or are these phones being criticized, or so, rightly so, as as rightly as a, a, a copycat? stuff. Uh, there is stuff which other people already have. The OLED is already in Samsung phones, it's been in Samsung phones for a number of years. Right. Um, the front-facing 3D scanner, that's not in any phones yet, that is an innovation. It's actually technology which a lot of it is kind of off the shelf and um, Apple's fine-tuned the software element. The thing that is really interesting is what Apple is doing in chips. It's very much under the hood, Couldn't geeky, more. wonky stuff, but it's the sort of thing which drives um, the ability to bring software innovations and therefore they can up update iOS 11 and going forward iOS 12, but that means that old phones become updated and you and I as the consumer are forced to buy the latest handset in order to, buy the late to get the latest software updates. And they're not handing over the profits to the chip makers uh, as, as all the computers did to Intel and as uh, the phone makers have done to Qualcomm, uh, the phone makers except for Apple. And, and that's why we're starting to see increasing tension from, um, with people like Qualcomm and they've cut out a number of suppliers. Imagination Technologies announced earlier this year that they were losing Apple as a customer. We saw yesterday Apple announced its own graphics processing unit, GPU, this chip which is used for gaming, uh, for games in the iPhone. So the more that Apple brings in-house, the more pressure they're putting on their chip-making suppliers. Alex Webb from Lumer News, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, so coming up next, we're going to take a look at uh, more news coming out of our big conference here in, uh, in Roosevelt Island uh, with uh, things that are coming sooner than you think. This is Bloomberg. A developing story out of Washington that we are watching. Social media is now a, quote, red-hot focus 
the special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation of the 2016 election, and possible links to President Trump's associates. Uh, that's according to U.S. officials familiar with the matter. Mueller's team of prosecutors and FBI agents zeroing in on how Russia spread fake and damaging information through social media. His team is seeking additional evidence from companies like Facebook and Twitter about what happened uh, on their networks. Of course, this comes after the revelation last week uh, from Facebook saying that it discovered about $100,000 in ad spending connected to fake accounts likely run from Russia. I think with the administration, big news uh, crossing just a little while ago, President Trump blocking a Chinese-backed investor from acquiring Lattice Semiconductor. This is rare. It's only happened a handful of times uh, over the years. President citing uh, security clearance that would have been necessary for this deal to happen. It's not happening. So who the heck is Lattice Semiconductor and why should we care? Uh, Ian King here, our semiconductor reporter uh, par excellence uh, from Bloomberg News. Uh, Lattice Semiconductor. Based in Portland, traditionally a lot of operations in Hillsborough, Oregon, yeah. they make what kind of chips? A yeah, very, very small company, billion and a half dollars is nothing in a market cap for a company like this. They make um, what are called FPGAs, uh, programmable type. Programmable of logic. That's right. So um, these are the kind of chips that, that a company can use, whether it's an automaker, a refrigerator maker, a cell phone maker, and, and they don't have to actually design the whole chip. They can just make the chip do certain stuff for them. Yeah, I mean, these, these, these chips have traditionally been used when you actually design another chip because you map it out using an FPGA, see if that works, and then away we go. We know it works, then we... So wait, so you, so you, so you use this because it's got a lot of functionality, oper, uh, uh, optionality. That's right. You can change And then you specify function. a chip once you've done that. That's correct. Yeah, you could change its function after it's been locked down in... This doesn't seem like, I, you know, it's all complex, it's semiconductor technology. It doesn't seem like really complex semiconductor technology. Yeah. No, um, it's, I mean, this is a company, is obviously not a large company. The product itself, you can argue, could be used in various ways that could be put, you know, u useful to the military and so forth. But really, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, what we're talking about is a sort of broadening of the CFIUS purview of a, cha you know, of a change in policy in, in Washington and a hardening of the stance in Washington towards China. Really. Is it, in other words, if France was acquiring a, a French-backed venture capital firm or a German-backed venture capital firm yeah. or might not face the same sort of uh, uh, pressure? Um, that would apparently be the case, yeah. Um, so uh, as it relates to this technology in and of itself, is there the suggestion here that somehow there could be um, embedded ability to monitor the use of these chips, that if, if a Chinese company, government-controlled company, could somehow see what's happening with all these chips right. if they were uh, disseminated through the marketplace? I mean, there, there, there is an element of that in that FPGAs are also used in networking, in networking. equipment. Quite, I think it's yeah, about 25, 28 percent of revenue last That's year right. for this a, company. A lot of the baseband, the base stations that are on phone networks have FPGAs in them that control various functions and can be updated. But it's, again, I, you know, I want to stress a bit quite clearly here. Of course, security is the stated reason. Of course, security is the reason why we look at these things. But fundamentally, the U.S. semiconductor industry, the U.S. government, does not want China coming in and taking those key capabilities away from it. Now, who else competes in this area? Well, Intel with Altera. I've you remember they bought Altera a couple, yeah. a couple of years ago for a lot of money. Uh, Xilinx is the and, other and, one. And, the, and the Altera business was a lot more focused on networking and also a lot bigger, right? Yeah, I mean, both Xilinx and Altera basically divide the market up between them. You know, the company we're talking about here is a bit player. Is there a notion, because I remember when the Altera deal went through, mm -hmm. there seemed to be a suggestion that FPGA was being used in a lot more stuff than it used to be, and that that might continue. As, I, I thought of it at the mm -hmm. time as sort of an FPGA chip was kind of an accelerator into, yeah. a, into a networking chip. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, this has always been the argument that these chips have had a specific use case, narrowly confined to communications for a long time, but also even more narrowly confined to the design of other chips. Um, and the suggestion was that they're going to spread, they're going to get into data centers, that people like Microsoft are actually using them in their data centers right now. So that is happening, but not very quickly. It's not so much the market opportunity, it's how these chips can be used. And I think a broader point here is we've seen the chip industry consolidate massively over the last couple of years. Right. As you know, we're down to 60% market share for the top 10 companies. That, you know, essentially the market has shrunk like mad. China needs to get into that industry, it doesn't have anybody in that top 10 is the largest market for semiconductors, was going to throw a lot of money at buying its own expertise, buying its own way into domesticating the industry with things like we've seen today. How is it going to do that now? Uh, it, it, maybe it's not that important, but it yeah. seems that it would also limit the ability of, of all the other semiconductor companies to get higher prices in the market with the notion that there might be a Chinese bidder out I there mean, somewhere. And that's exactly been it. If you're a company like Lattice is, sub-scale sub basically, what do you do? 
right? Everybody else is getting together. You, you haven't been bought and you can't buy anybody else. Uh, that, that would make sense. Where do you go? I mean, the, the, the sort of one haven was supposedly all of this money that China right. had, you know, said it was going to spend. That'll come through. That'll be our, our rainy day fund. Not yeah. looking like it's going to happen. Glad it's something to their last uh, home on a Saturday night all alone. <laughs> sad, Ian. It's sad. Ian King, uh, Chips uh, reporter here at Bloomberg News. Thank you very much. All right, well, Toshiba, speaking of chips, is uh, getting closer to finally selling its chip-making division, the Japanese multinational, signing a memo of understanding with Bain. Bain Capital uh, may be hoping they'll reach a final, final agreement by the end of the month. Toshiba uh, originally announced a potential $19 billion deal with the Bain-led consortium back in July. The memo uh, does not prevent Toshiba from negotiating with other interested parties if they can find one. But that's the whole deal. They're trying to avoid being delisted on the Japanese stock exchange after lots of internal problems at Toshia. All right, coming up, we're going to bring you a sit down with the Blue Apron CEO Matt Salzberg after the company's IPO has face planted. What next? We'll see. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang and we're uh, uh, continuing our coverage of Bloomberg Sooner Than You Think conference. Uh, let's get right now to uh, Alex Brink who is on stage with the CEO of Blue Apron. Uh, May 15th did its very first deliveries on May 15th and in Q2. It's a pre-IPO. Uh, pre-IPO which is very first delivery but in Q2 and our IPO happened right at the end of Q2 um, at the beginning of Q3. Um, it was about 3% of our network's volume. And Linden has been a big investment for us because we've been investing very um, aggressively in our supply chain in order to get people new products, more flexible offerings, um, new ability to monetize our customers um, with personalized offerings and lower um, infrastructure costs. And so Linden was a big opportunity for us and still is a big opportunity for us. We still expect it to be our lowest cost operating center in our network. But as we moved into Q3 with our ramp plans, we um, were a little overly optimistic on how quickly we could ramp it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of work. Our business, one of the important things to understand is it's incredibly hard to do what we do. If you think about operationally what's involved with getting a Blue Apron home cooking experience to people all over the country, working with hundreds of farmers, we're growing ingredients, we're bringing them into our fulfillment centers, doing quality control, portioning, packaging, shipping, and delivering nationally in a high quality way, that's an incredibly difficult logistics. That's fair, fair yeah. point. But that's what your value you're pitching to investors is that you can figure out these hard yeah, problems. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're doing, just to be 100% clear. Linden is about a startup of a new center. And so because it took us a little, it's taking us a little bit longer to launch Linden, we're operating two centers side by side in New Jersey right now. That obviously has additional costs mm -hmm. associated with it. Those are short term costs because we are closing down our Jersey City Fulfillment Center and opening up our Linden Fulfillment Center. And so it's taking us a little bit longer. We were a little overly optimistic and we realized that as we were getting through Q3 um, in terms of our ramp plans, but we're working on a number of initiatives, both short term and medium term in nature to get Linden up and running and take on about half of our network's volume. And, uh, you know, that's that's what we're doing. And you're having to do it all in the public eye. Would this have been something that was better worked through had you been a private company? Look, you know, um, you got to be a confident company and you have to be confident about what we're trying to do. We're very confident in what we're trying to accomplish with our business. Mm -hmm. We're building a company that's about meal experiences, about helping people cook at home and going through a large industry that's in massive transition as more and more dollars move off, uh, from offline to online and as new brands capture share from old brands that are no longer relevant to customers in the world we live in where people are looking for healthier alternatives, more participatory, emotional brands and experiences. And so um, we feel really good about our long-term prospects. And you know, what, is, what does that mean? That means, look, what, we have to do the things that we need to do to achieve our long-term goals. Going public, in my view, is one of those things that has helped make our company stronger through access to capital, through access to having a, um, the capital markets and um, a public currency for talent mm -hmm. and the like. And um, you know, we have to be confident to say, look, we know what we're trying to do. We know who we are as a company. And um, you know, as we execute over time, 
people get to know us better in the public markets and they'll, they'll appreciate what we're doing. I, I do want to unpack one other thing uh, in that rundown that I, that I gave our audience here, this, the stepping down of your COO. And, and uh, the, uh, to my understanding, there's a bit of a reorganization of the, the structure yep. at Blue Apron too. Uh, talk us through that briefly. Yeah, so there was an important reorganization that we were working on and um, completed at the time we announced that uh, my co-founder was stepping down. And that was part of that whole reorganization for the company. And as we're moving into this next phase of company life, it's more important than ever for us to be able to innovate fast on emerging consumer needs, on understanding our core customers who love to cook and want to cook with Blue Apron, but they have a diversity of needs. Mm -hmm. And for the first five years of the business's life, we've been very focused on scale because we um, saw a very large and attractive market and we felt the need to attract capital and talent and resources to invest in building a world-class brand and supply chain that allows us to deliver great products at great prices. But now, in this next phase of the company's growth, obviously scale is still important, but personalization and innovation on new products so that we can address new segments of customers mm -hmm. that we have historically not addressed because we've been focused and focused on scale and monetization um, in increasingly uh, stronger ways in terms of revenue per customer are focuses of ours. So what we did with the reorganization is we divided up some of the teams in the company more clearly to allow us to go after new product opportunities. Mm -hmm. We um, elevated Tim Smith, who's now our SVP of Consumer Products, and Pablo Cusati, who's now our SVP of Operations, to help divide those and help us accelerate our consumer products roadmap. I have to ask, though, the timing of it. This is post-IPO. You came out with a team, you pitched your story to public market investors, and then you turn around, you know, just days, weeks later, and are reorganize, reorganizing the DNA of your company. Why, why, this, why did that decision happen when it did? Look, you know, we, uh, no company should sit still and do nothing. Um, my job as CEO is to every day do what I can do to improve the business. Mm -hmm. And our job as a company is to every day take one step forward. Literally every day we do new things, and every day we will continue to do new things. So um, in terms of the exact way that we have personnel structured and the like, you know, um, we will continue to make decisions when we come to crossroads and see opportunities to improve the company. And we're not afraid to make changes when we see opportunities to make changes. That's our job. You talk about confidence and trust, though. Uh, some of the, the buy side folks, some of the investors that I've talked to don't like to see these kind of changes so soon after you did pitch a narrative. How do you, and thinking back to that, that stock chart with your stock down 46% since listing, how do you continue to instill trust in the investment community, in your, yeah. your strategy Look, going I think forward? we need to execute. And we need to show investors that we're doing the things that we say we're gonna do. And we need to continue to build uh, value by building a great brand mm -hmm great products, great supply chain, and continue to engage our millions of customers all over the country. And you know, we just gotta continue to prove that. I think people, as they get to know us better, will begin to appreciate the amazing assets that we built mm -hmm. and the strategy that we're going after, I think. And if investors say, hey, we don't want change, I think that's misguided because um, it's a company's job to continue to change in new and new um, market environments when they see new opportunities and you know, in fact, the weakest companies are the ones that are afraid to change. Mm -hmm. So I think our willingness to continue to change and evolve and build a business in a gigantic market and a gigantic market opportunity is something that I, as, as the largest shareholder of the company, quite frankly, am really excited about for our prospects. So you talk about making more money off of your existing users, uh, kind of focusing on that channel, uh, maybe as well as looking at scaling your core product. Those value add, talk us through your biggest opportunities there. Why are you different? Frankly, there are so many people out there trying to feed you. Why is Blue Apron different? Yeah, well look, the food and grocery market is one of the largest markets that exists out there. Mm -hmm. It's not a winner takes all market. There will be many brands and many kinds of companies out there trying to feed you in different ways. What we stand for is this love of home cooking and the experience of home cooking and the lifestyle around that. Our mission as a company is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, and people don't all know this, but the reason we call the company Blue Apron is because chefs around the world wear Blue Aprons when they're learning to cook. So for us, it's the symbol of lifelong learning and cooking. And this experiential participatory component of what we do is core at how we engage our customers, 
it's really important to understand, we think of our business as a branded consumer products company, mm -hmm. not just a distributor of other people's products. So we have to be great at innovating on products around customer needs and have the supply chain to be able to do that in a high quality, low cost way. Those new innovations, touch on some of those. Yeah, so there's a number of things. The one we just announced recently, as uh, a couple of things we announced recently. One, we've been expanding mm -hmm. our menu offerings to allow us to offer different um, combinations of meals to address different customer segments. So we have more recipes on our menu now that are designed intelligently to accommodate wider audiences, more flexibility for our customers, pick more, less recipes a week, any kind of combinations of recipes they mm -hmm. want. We also recently announced 30 minute meals, mm -hmm. which are meals that are specifically designed to be really fast for people with things like we might send you pre-chopped chicken mm -hmm. or um, a pre-made pesto sauce or just a recipe that's meant for a really, really fast meal. And we have some customers who want faster and some customers who want more discovery. When I hear that though, that does still sound similar to the core product, to the couples or the family offering, well, look, or at least it's the same meal time. Are there, is there additional value add, or additional sure. add-ons? Where does that additional yeah. revenue well, there's, come from? There's a lot, and by the way, the biggest opportunity is in the core of what we do, because we're still um, very underpenetrated mm -hmm. in terms of opportunity in the core of what we do, and um, we're still under-optimized in terms of our opportunity to address wider range of tastes preferences and profiles in the core of what we do. So that is the biggest near-term continuous expansion mm -hmm. opportunity for us. But we're also investing in things like our wine business. Mm -hmm. And we're a, um, a direct-to-consumer winery, which mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize. We create incredible wines okay. that pair with Blue Apron Meals from a content perspective. Mm -hmm. um, things like White Burgundy for 10 bucks for a bottle and Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, incredible wines made by great winemakers. We also have a, a cooking supplies business and a small pantry items business, mm -hmm. where we are um, selling products around that home cooking experience, uh, complementing the core of what we do. And there's a lot of and other opportunities very for own us to do additional add Alex Barinka at our uh, Sooner Than You Think conference at Roosevelt Island in New York. All right, Alibaba executives are dumping shares. They've announced a plan to sell 16 million shares every year, representing 9% of the founder Jack Ma's stake, according to the company. You hear a lot more about Alibaba in Bloomberg's special coverage on Alibaba. We're going to bring you interviews with the founder Jack Ma, co-founder Joe Tsai, and CEO Daniel Zhang. We'll be showcasing those interviews around the world culminating in a special half-hour program on Friday. I believe when trade stops, war starts. Free is not a viable model, but patience is. Everybody has a big chance to go digital. It's called Sophia Genetics. It's a Swiss technology company helping hospitals process genome data. It's nailed down 30 million extra dollars to fund expansion into North America. A six year old startup uses artificial intelligence and plans to process genomic information. It's planning to use this funding, uh, which was led by London based VC firm Baldwin Capital, to expand beyond genome analysis into medical imaging. Sophia works with 334 hospitals in 53 countries, mostly Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Now 59 million has been raised in equity investments since its founding in 2011. All right, the role of artificial intelligence in business was a big focus at Bloomberg's Sooner Than You Think conference in Roosevelt Island. IBM CEO Ginny Romney is reinventing Big Blue, and she's hoping to help use companies' AI, tech, AI technology, that's artificial intelligence, of course, uh, every day as the company's revenues fall and their profits fall. But Romney sat down with Megan Murphy from Bloomberg uh, Business Week and asked about uh, Watson and AI's role in healthcare. This is a really another key point about professional AI. Doctors don't want a black and white answer, nor does any profession. If you're a professional, my guess is when you interact with AI, you don't want it to say, here's an answer. What a doctor wants is, okay, give me the possible answers. Tell me why you believe it. Um, can I see the research, the evidence, the percent confidence? What more would you like to know? That's really what we're doing. And the first cancer took almost a year. We're down to less than 30 days now. And by the end of this year, Watson will have been trained on what causes 80% of the world's cancers. 
All right, also at this conference, Qualcomm, the chip giant uh, executive chairman, Paul Jacobs, says he's still confident that their NXP acquisition, NXP Semiconductor, the company they're trying to acquire, he thinks they're still going to get it at the price that Qualcomm is offering, despite calls from some investors to raise that price. We're going ahead with the transaction the way that we, we intended, and, uh, and that's, you know, we will see how this plays out. Obviously, you talked about the regulatory issues as well. So no, nothing great in the world gets done as a slam dunk. There's always pieces to the puzzle that you have to work around. This is just another piece of the puzzle, but we feel like it's a fair price. Qualcomm has promised that deal is going to be concluded by the end of the year. It's set to pay $47 billion in its offer. All right, coming up, we go back to the conference, Bloomberg Markets. Joel Weber is on stage right now with the Two Sigma Investments co-founder, David Siegel. Turning back to our live coverage of Bloomberg Sooner Than You Think conference there in Roosevelt Island in New York. It's underway right now at the new Cornell campus. Uh, there, Bloomberg's Markets, uh, Joel Weber's on stage right now with Two Sigma uh, Investments co-founder David Siegel well, making the case that his company is first and foremost a tech salary. company. Take a listen. And I think that the, uh, the ideas and, and, and the, the, uh, the educational programs being developed here will help to prepare New York City for this future that is really rapidly changing everything that we know about the world. Right. So, one of the most unique things about Two Sigma, I think, is that uh, you're a scientist by background. We, we, you mentioned a couple words already, laboratory being one of them. The, as a scientist, you're also uh, a financial uh, participant in the markets, right? You're, a, you're an investment firm. Uh, so talk to me about how that happened. How did you get into that field? Well, investing is a really interesting problem from a scientific perspective. Uh, you know, a lot of people, um, you, you know, uh, invest from uh, a, a very intuitive, uh, in an intuitive way, which is t totally fine. And, uh, you, you know, gut instinct and, uh, you know, maybe assisted by some data. But really, from um, my uh, view, in, you, there's another angle to investing, and it, it actually is truly, you know, something where you can deeply apply the scientific method where every aspect of the process of investing can be converted into some sort of scientific hypothesis that you can test with data. It's very, very, very scientific. And so you know, I was not, I have a, a PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence. It wasn't my intention, my lifelong dream to be an investment manager. I just thought it was a really interesting problem with a lot of data. And I thought that if you looked at the problem from a different perspective, you might be able to come up with some very interesting, perhaps even better solutions to the problem. Right. What was your aha moment when you started first doing that? Uh, well, I mean, I, you, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not really like that. Uh, you, you, you know, it, it's basically all very gradual. Um, you, you know, when, when, when I started Two Sigma, uh, you know, it was just, you know, we're, you know, it was a continuum. We're working on things. We're looking at numbers. We're trying to figure out a good way to do this. And then, you know, eventually the company got to be pretty big. But, uh, you know, I, there was never any one moment where I said, aha, we, we really figured this thing out. Right. So actually, interesting, Two Sigma started in 2001 here in New York. So much has changed between now and then. And also in your course over the you know, the trajectory of AI and the importance of AI now. Can you talk a little bit about what's changed from the, the beginnings of where you started in the field to what you're seeing now? Well, I, you know, you, you know I, I think that um, uh, machine learning uh, is really, uh, you know, in the last, you know, uh, 15, 16 years has completely taken off. And uh, it's really changed the way people think about data. Uh, and, you know, machine learning is, in a way, uh, the best method anyone has yet come up with to um, algorithmically find knowledge in unstructured data. And, and that's a, you know, if you have a lot of data, uh, machine learning can be an incredibly powerful tool. tool. And, 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 you know, it, it's, you know, I don't have to explain to people how much machine learning has changed your everyday lives. Uh, um, you know, it's impacting pretty much, you know, everything that you 
see and read. Uh, machine learning is being used to, to, uh, to guide um, searching uh, on the internet. Machine learning guides your social networking. It, it guides you know, what you're reading on your Facebook news feed. Machine learning is really the story of our times. Yeah. So you, there's a glass half full, glass half empty approach to that. How do you view the world? Are you, how do you, you know, wrestle with these big questions? But ultimately, are you an optimist? Uh, oh, I'm a, a total optimist. However, I want to be realistic about change. And so you can be extremely optimistic about the future, but that, and so I think that AI and machine learning, you know, have a really good story. I think that in the end, it will make our lives much, much better. However, you know, between now and, uh, you know, I don't know, 20 years from now, there may be a very bumpy road as, not may, there will be a very bumpy road as society is adjusting to these changes. So now the question is, how will we navigate the bumps? So if you're driving down a bumpy road and you ignore the, the, the potholes, what happens? You get a flat tire. So we have to be a little careful to not get too many flat tires along the way. I love that you're making it real for an audience of New Yorkers. Exactly. Familiar, very familiar with potholes. What are, what are some of those complications that aren't being talked about enough? Well, you know, machine learning is taking away our privacy. Uh, you know, pretty much the ability for algorithms to rapidly process vast amounts of data has opened up the possibility of algorithms um, understanding you better than you may understand yourself. And that's, you know, something that we have to get used to. Yeah. And so the implications also in investing when you start looking ahead, hello helicopter, a couple, a couple years down the road, right? Like how is this going to change uh, the investing landscape? Well, I, you, you know, machine learning will basically change how every business operates. And uh, it will basically, uh, and what, it, what, what it's doing in investing and in other fields is um, essentially taking the co certain kinds of work that we thought required lots and lots of human skill and you know, making it possible for a computer to do it better and faster. And so what it's doing is it's destroying certain kinds of skilled jobs and um, it's allowing us to get better results, right? Machine learning algorithms have been shown to, to uh, read uh, medical images, in some cases better than radiologists can. It's, it's going through field after field. It can identify your children in photos pro, you know, probably better than many of you can, can yourself, which is you know, pretty shocking. And so these changes are going to uh, essentially up the bar. So humans will need to and can compete with these algorithms, but they will have to change their skills. We're going to have to change our skills. Right. I'm talking as if I'm not a human. We'll have to change <laughs> our skills to be able to um, better work in collaboration with these uh, very sophisticated algorithms. So for the students who are coming through here, what advice do you have for them? I, you know, I, you know, you know I, I, that, that, that is a great question. And I, 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 you know, from my own experience, I'll tell you, so that when I was at MIT uh, back, I got there in 1983, th that was you know, around when the internet was uh, first uh, turned on. I, I think it was something like 1983. And no one there uh, imagined the impact that the internet would have in, in such a relatively short amount of time. That was Two Sigma Investments co-founder David Siegel live from our uh, Sooner Than You Think conference uh, in Roosevelt Island in New York City. You've been watching Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg.